and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Every financial institution must evaluate how to adapt its technology strategies to support business change, operational resilience, and digital response. More than ever, the ability to innovate at speed and scale has become a core competitive requirement. In this year's Digital Bank Report, Innovation Retail Banking 2021, sponsored by Infants Finical and EFMA, it was found that the importance of innovation has taken center stage at many financial institutions. Our guests on the Banking Transform podcast today are Sanat Rao, CEO of Infosys Finical, and Miguel Rio Tinto, Group CIO and CDO at Emirates MBD. We'll discuss the increase in innovation and digital transformation maturity of financial institutions and what still needs to be done. A winning formula for innovation in banking must focus on how it will impact the user experience, whether this is the external customer or the internal employee or both. Taking an experience-focused approach can help financial institutions compete with the challenger mindset of startups and scale of big tech players. Whether we are talking about disruptive innovation or incremental improvements, innovation will be a key source of current and long-term competitive advantage, and creating the right environment is critical for differentiating for success. As I mentioned, we have two leaders who have made amazing strides in spearheading innovation within their respective organizations. Miguel Rio Tinto is the group CIO and CDO at Emirates MBD, and Sanat Rao is the CEO of Infosys Finical, the sponsor of the innovation and retail banking research that has been done for the past 13 years and is published by the Digital Bank Report. Before we get started, gentlemen, could you share a little bit about yourself and the background for those who are listening who may not be aware of who you are? Let's start with Miguel. Hi, Jim. Uh, a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Miguel Rio Tinto, nothing to do with the Rio Tinto Mining Company. So, but uh, I'm the CDO and the CIO of um, uh, Emirates NBD. I joined the bank about four and a half years ago. Uh, previously to that, I was a senior partner at McKinsey, actually focused on digital and technology. I was leading the digital McKinsey in Iberia for a, for a long time. And I'm an engineer at heart and uh, always been an engineer and uh, will continue to be an engineer until I'm, I'm, I'm dead, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Sanat? Yeah, thanks, Jim, for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm Sanat and I'm speaking to you from the UK where I live. Um, so I've been privileged to lead Finical's business for the past four plus years uh, at a time when, uh, you know, technology is arguably the biggest enabler of both superior business performance on the one hand and of uh, enabling outstanding customer experience on the other. Uh, prior to joining Infosys Finical, I used to be a senior partner with IBM in their global consulting organization here in the UK. Um, at Finical, of course, we are fortunate to work with um, leading banks all over the world, including leaders such as Emirates NBD. Um, in the last 18 months of COVID, while we've had to do a lot of work with our clients as they've adjusted to the new way of working, uh, on a personal front, you know, besides technology and banking, my passion has really been in an emerging social science called digital anthropology, where I've acquired uh, qualifications. And I'm also presently uh, doing an uh, MPhil at the University of Cambridge in the area of AI ethics which I think is going to be increasingly relevant as we talk about the emerging technologies and how organizations are going to develop and deploy them. So a pleasure to be here and looking forward to this conversation. So Sanal, let's start with you. The pandemic has been a defining moment for digital adoption. How do you think digital banking transformation banking has evolved over the past 18 months? And where do you see the industry heading in the next year? So. Uh, Jim, may I just start by saying that, you know, like I mentioned to you before we began this regular uh, um, uh, recording, I'm a, a regular listener of Banking Transform, and I think you do a great job with the hosts who you have featured uh, weekly on your show. So I really love your podcasts. Uh, coming to your question, well, COVID is still, you know, very much in our midst, though hopefully we've seen the worst of it as different countries and economies come out of uh, the environment that we'd seen in the last 18 months. Uh, that said, I'd like to believe that the transformational change as a result of COVID is still ongoing and that banks are still discovering ways to, you know, reinvent themselves and their offerings as the world adapts to uh, a completely new way of doing business, if you like. 
Uh, and whether it's through relentless innovation, whether it's through back office re-engineering, uh, whether it's the capabilities that are available through modernizing the technology <coughs> infrastructure, or quite simply, uh, you know, whether it's in developing new, um, you know, leadership paradigms. I think banks are aware that there are very different ways in which they can lead. While there's no doubt that the world has evolved in a manner that was, uh, I would say, completely unexpected and unanticipated when COVID hit us um, early last year, I think the challenge here on is going to be to ensure that the change that we've begun seeing in the last 18 months is sustained. Um, mind you, we live in an era where the customer is more demanding than ever before. And if anything, those expectations, I think, have increased manifold in the past 18 months. And therefore, in my opinion, you know, staying relevant is going to be the biggest concern for uh, the leaders of banks today and going forward. Uh, consequently, you know, I think banks are going to be in a stage of continual transformation. Um, in the report that we recently did with FMA that you referred to in your opening comments, uh, Jim, um, this year's report in innovation retail banking um, stated that 14% of the respondents felt that their organization's digital transformation has scaled. Now, that was 7% last year. To that extent, you know, things have moved in the right direction. Though, personally speaking, I was a little surprised that it's only for 14%. I thought it might be a little uh, higher than that. While there's no doubt that, you know, there are many different fo areas to focus on, let me just sort of end by saying that I think uh, banks can scale their digital transformation in one or more of the following areas. Uh, one is, of course, I think maximizing the level of digital customer engagements to drive growth. And as we've seen, engagement starting from onboarding is turning out to be an increasingly important element in the way relationships start with uh, their banks. The second is, um, you know, digitizing and automating ubiquitously to cut costs. Um, and efficiency of operation has received a lot of attention, I think, in the last 18 months. The third element I'd point to is the need to continuously innovate and to create new value and indeed to just stay competitive. Um, this is the era of technology and therefore leveraging the power of new technologies, whether it's moving to the cloud, whether it's the unlocking of potential through APIs and AIs. I think that's the fourth element. And last but not the least, I think something that often doesn't get the kind of credit it deserves is the ability to leverage talented teams um, and as we discussed uh, a while ago, uh, Jim, before we started this recording, the fight for talent has become enormous uh, in the recent past. And I think the leveraging of talented teams is going to be hugely important for banks and indeed other industries going forward. So these are the areas that I'd point to in terms of where I think banks will focus their attention uh, beyond COVID. That's great. You know, Miguel, Emirates MBD is the largest bank in the Middle East, not only serving retail, small business, corporate customers, but also digital only brands such as Live and E20. How has your experience been in the last 18 months and what are the key differences that you've observed within your organization as it comes out of the COVID phase? Yeah, so, so um, uh, as you know, uh, and you pointed out in the beginning, uh, Emerson VD has, has been quite an innovative company um, uh, with an innovative uh, uh, culture uh, from the onset. Uh, <coughs> and it, it has been a reference uh, over the past at least two decades on innovating in banking and, and putting forward the best solutions for its customers. Um, so we were, when COVID hit us, we were uh, exactly in the, in the middle of a, a very big, very broad IT transformation, part of uh, what had been decided at the bank to be a core focus uh, starting in 2017 and going through 2018 and 19, which was really to, 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 to look at the bank, understand that uh, banking is all about technology currently, understanding what is out there in terms of uh, of uh, the best of breed in, in competing in the technology space, bringing that into banking, bringing that into a, an incumbent bank, and of course, transforming. When, when, when that, we were exactly in the middle of that, doing a little bit of business as usual for a bank like Emirates MBD. But, but when COVID hit, uh, hit us, uh, I, I, I think two things happened. So on one hand, all those things that we're doing, all those trends that we were observing, they significantly accelerated. Uh, I'll give you two examples. So, you know, a, a lot of us uh, uh, had to, to work from home, had to stay at home, had to interact with our bank, banks from home. Um, a survey we just conducted now 
um, reflecting on how our customers uh, would like to interact with our banks. So one third of the customers that about two years ago told us that their preferred channel of interaction with the bank would be through a, through a human in a branch or a call center. One third of those currently now say that they prefer to interact with the digital channels of the bank. So the, achieving that in 18 months is, is a huge <clears throat> change. I, I know that this was going to come. This would come um, in, in the short term, but it, it actually was very, very accelerated. So everything that we were doing in terms of enabling ser servicing, enabling sales, enabling a fantastic user experience through digital channels in our bank, all that became extremely relevant, much more relevant than before and much more accelerated. Huh? On the other hand, we, we were surprised that uh, because uh, COVID had, had to uh, hit us and we had to think a little bit out of the box on how to handle much of the the obstacles that were coming our way, we were surprised that we, we, we discovered new opportunities that were not there before. One of them is, is this example of working from home. So a bank is typically, so we have a bank here, uh, we are total about 25,000 employees. Um, our operation in Turkey is about 10,000 employees. So if you take without Turkey, the 15,000 employees working mainly in the Middle East, um, one day we had about 99% of those employees working completely from home. And that means call centers working from home, operations working from home, development working from home, IT operations, the data center, command center, all working from home. And so if you can do that, that opens, of course, opportunities going forward that were not there uh, in, in the way that, that you develop uh, in a distributed fashion with people that are not just look, uh, working here physically in your offices and so on. That, that's one example. Um, the, the other thing that, that, uh, that we saw is that uh, the, 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 uh, f from, from uh, a perspective of products and services, that we're actually not not even thinking about bringing bringing to 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 a different way of working, a different way of enabling them for the customers customers remotely. Those things were solved. We had a lot of bureaucracy, for example, and, and regulation around si signage of documents, mm -hmm. around making business happen and formalize business in a in 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 the previous environment we were in. Uh, a, a lot pushed by the government as well that, that actually opened the avenues for us to solve a lot of those problems remotely. So immediately, much of what was impossible before just became possible in one day. No? And, and so those are huge opportunities now that, that they actually can leverage going forward. But, uh, and again, as, as Sanat has, has said, so these 18 months, these this 20 months now, almost 24 months since the bit, I heard today in the news that it's, it's today, uh, 24 months that uh, that the first case I think was reported or something. So it's two years already. Um, I think I think they were absolutely transformative uh, for MSNBD. Now going forward, we have a, a, a very ambitious agenda that has been even even uh, uh, we are doubling down significantly on on what we're doing uh, in the context of what we are uh, doing before, but also these new opportunities that open up. Well, stick with you, Miguel, because, you know, interesting dynamics on, on the change in the work environment, all that. But, you know, you're in a real competitive marketplace there and, and you're a large bank. How have you responded to the challenge of competitors that really play by, in many cases, different rules? And what is your guidance to incumbent firms like yours based on your experience on, on how to deal with the, the fintechs and, the, you know, more importantly, probably the big techs that really are, are doing things differently and, and have certainly a different base of business to start with? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, again, I would answer those, those that <clears throat> question in, in, in two, two, uh, two planes. No? One, one is, so in the market, um, uh, in the business that we are, which is banking, um, the bank, the bank actually understands that in many instances, the value proposition that we have out there to serve our customers need, needs to be completely reset uh, in the context of uh, some paradigm shifts that are happening. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know that that we've launched a completely digital bank, Live, um, and, and the reason why we did that with a different brand. It's, it's an upside bank in the sense that banking is, is not the first thing you see when you think about living. You see, you see lifestyle, you see offers, and then you do banking as, as, as something that is embedded in that. Mm -hmm. And that came actually from two things that we've noticed. One is, is we were, we were 
uh, not uh, getting our market share on the new customers coming into banking, in the, into the millennial customers. So apparently our core value proposition, main bank value proposition was, was not enticing enough for the millennials. So what is it that they're thinking about? What is it that we should need to launch for them? So Live became, became that. Uh, and, and second, even the way that you frame your processes, that you think about straight through completely in a digital setting, uh, no longer leveraging the legacy processes of the bank, but really thinking uh, bottom up, out of the box to, to, to launch that. So the bank decided, let's launch a new bank. And, and Live, for you to have an idea, so monthly, so we now have about uh, 500,000 customers, half a million customers in the UAE, uh, customers of Live. Monthly, we open more accounts in the digital bank live than we do in the 100 branches that we have in the main bank. So every month we you acquire more customers via a digital app that can be downloaded on an app store and where you can onboard the bank in three minutes. You, you, you acquire more customers in this way and more customers in the demographics that you'd like to have than you do with all the 100 branches and all the salespeople that we have acquiring customers that that actually are coming to the main bank. And this is this is uh, absolutely amazing and transformative. Uh, and so this is how, how we are responding to 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 the market, the market uh, and the competitive pressures that are coming. Um, we are embracing these trends. You have to be courageous enough to challenge your 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 status quo on everything from the value proposition, as I highlighted, to the processes, to the to 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 whatever you're doing now, sometimes it will not work for the new for the new paradigms, and you have to be uh, fast enough, innovative enough, uh, and and transformative enough to launch this this proposition. That's that's more on the on the on the on the business side of things. No, on the IT side and on the technology side, I, I'm very lucky because my my ex or my CEO. They, they, they have an understanding that is not just from now. It's, it's from many years, uh, five, six, seven, eight years from now, for, uh, before. They have an understanding that technology is a core competency of the bank, probably the, the most important competency of the bank. And they have been uh, the, the, the CEO articulates this uh, very, very well. He, he is the first to articulate, and he's a traditional banker in the sense that he, he was he was raised as a traditional banker, but he articulates this very well so because he understands that I'm at the heart, a bank is a technology company. And he, he phrases this that constantly. Uh, I've worked as a consultant with other banks previously, and, and many of them, I mean, at the core, they see themselves as bankers. The bankers are, you know, and and here I think the 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 understanding that technology is really at the core is 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 very embedded, and very very embedded at the from the top. And the second one that that he, he clearly states uh, is is all our strategy goes through digital. If we don't digitize, we're going to die. And he articulates that very well as well. So these two things, I'm very lucky because. Um, sometimes in other organizations, other incumbent organizations, you you as a CIO have to convince your board, you have to convince your CEO that, look, this is important. Here, I don't need to convince anyone. These guys are the ones putting me pressure and giving me the resources, actually, which is very good to, to, to be able to do to do transformation. So on, on technology, uh, and I touched, uh, I, I, I highlighted a little bit, a little bit the um, technology transformation we, we, we are doing and, and that we, we've just concluded a very large four-year transformation um, where really the, the, it's, it's no longer, the reference is no longer the best of breed of the banks. The reference is the best, best of breed of the technology companies that are out there. <laughs> what are they using? What kind of uh, technology stacks are they using? Um, what kind of... Uh, of innovative approaches on they, how they manage big data sets or how they manage API and integration and all of that. So the bank brought this inspiration from the best of what is out there and it's bringing it to banking. And, and believe me, our reference is no bank out there. There's no bank out there that is our reference. Our reference are fintechs, our tech fins, our, our um, big companies that have solved a lot of these problems of uh, speed and scale and 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 reliability in the context of uh, of large scale companies like Amazon and so on. You, you're bringing that know-how and bringing it to banking. This is what we have been doing. So two pronged uh, response to you, which one is on the business side and one is on the core on the technology side as well. 
you have to be transforming constantly. You know, it's interesting. We we did a one of our podcasts on your uh, solution live, and it's it's an extraordinary story because it's an open banking story. It's a segment story, and as you mentioned, we're we're finding this more and more that organizations have to find new ways to acquire customers. That the traditional ways of waiting for the people to come in the branch or waiting for people simply to respond to digital marketing, really, we have to expand our 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 experiences and our realm of influence. And, and where we target. But digital gives you the ability to do that because there's so much information in the digital world. It gives you the ability to do it at scale and in completely different ways. So, so not, you know, it's interesting. Many non-traditional entrants uh, leveraging technology-led models and are differentiating their propositions through innovative business models. And they're systematically diminishing the competitive advantages of established banks. Your organization works with banks of various sizes. How do you see banks driving business model innovation in an evolving market context and being able to do it if you're a small bank or a big bank? Uh, so you're right, Jim. You know, at Cynical, we've been obviously very fortunate to have been uh, able to work with banks in over 100 countries. And uh, I wouldn't say fortunate. It's actually been our privilege to work with uh, banks in so many different countries. Uh, whether it's large banks like Emirates NBD, who've been trendsetters in many ways, or indeed many other institutions. I think the uh, the truth is that, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all approach, and the kind of innovation uh, varies, obviously, across countries based on a variety of factors, um, starting with whether a bank is a, you know, whether you call them a pioneer or a fast follower. Uh, sometimes there may be even laggards who've now been pushed to make the kind of change that's necessary because of what COVID has done to the world in the last 18, 24 months. Uh, certainly, it's influenced by the kind of uh, digital infrastructure that's available uh, in the country and around. Um, I think there's a big influence of the policy framework under which it operates. And of course, we can't overlook competition. And, you know, Miguel referred to uh, the kind of benchmarks that non-banks are setting today uh, for the banking industry. So I think the variety of factors uh, that are obviously at play. However, I think globally, uh, you know, many traditional banks have seen their competitive advantages, whether that is of reach, uh, the size and scale of the customer base, whether it's the product choice that they make available, the kind of expertise that they have um, in-house. Uh, uh, all of this has sort of begun eroding, uh, you know, uh, somewhat over the last few years. Now, Miguel here represents NBD, who are, I think, a great example, uh, who shed uh, who dispel the notion that, you know, if you're large, then you can't be agile and, uh, you know, you can't be innovative. But I think Emirates and BD have been a great example of a bank that has leveraged technology under Miguel's leadership to differentiate themselves consistently. Uh, however, that said, uh, it's also true that many others have struggled. So, you know, to that extent, I think uh, whether it's a non-bank or the neo-banks who've used technology and innovation to diminish, you know, those advantages, while differentiating themselves with innovative offerings or great experiences, and indeed highly uh, you know, cost-efficient services. I think today the incumbent bank, uh, which are largely vertically integrated through a traditional pipeline business model, is unraveling new models. Uh, and a lot of these new models, of course, are facilitated by the fact that technology supports them. So technology is no longer the hindrance here. Technology indeed is the enabler. And the ability for a bank to transform to a new model is built on factors which are outside of technology. Uh, you know, Jim, I was uh, reminded of a recent podcast that you recorded with Ron Shevlin, where both of you were rewinding the great banking debate. Um, and something that you touched upon was the business model. Uh, I think there are several approaches that a bank th that can take, uh, you know, towards reimagining its business model. Um, We've recently completed a research report on digital banking business model innovation along with 11FS. Um, and we've organized the new model into largely eight different archetypes, if you like, uh, where we're seeing a lot of action. I think the model that is seeing uh, a lot of traction is embedded finance and Miguel uh, sort of uh, uh, referred to this. And not unexpectedly, I might add here, that embedded finance is increasingly, you know, uh, assuming more and more importance. I think here companies such as, you know, whether it's Apple, Amazon, Uber, and a host of others of uh, a similar genre, if you like, uh, are masters of, you know, engagement and customer insight. 
uh, they've embedded banking and banking like services and payments into their products and services so i think that's certainly one element of a new model that's increasingly uh, turning out to be relevant now i'd stress this point that while it's not necessary it's probably not a model that is seen by a majority of institutions i think the ones who are beginning to adopt that model are going to be the real disruptors so if a bank believes that a majority are not doing this they shouldn't take uh, you know false comfort in that because the handful that will take this model will be the one that will really disrupt then you have um, you know the digital only banks and miguel referred to live you know who deliver services entirely through uh, digital touch points you know their strengths are you know high quality of experience uh, from the onboarding process uh, indeed a much lower operating cost than traditional banks and most target uh, tech savvy consumers and small businesses uh, and indeed some of them you know work with even narrower segments uh, and gradually sort of expand their reach the third element at point 2 is um, the banking as a service model now i confess that this is something that is still at a very early stage of maturity and therefore this terminology probably means different things to different banks but these are you know complete banking processes that are offered through apis so third parties can embed them in their own products and services you know goldman sachs solaris bank and a handful of others in indeed in different geographies i think are notable examples there are of course other types and other models available whether it's digital financial advisors whether it is Uh, you know finance and non finance marketplaces uh, whether it's the banking industry utilities which are talked about but i think you know not too many have really scaled and banking curators so i think a variety of diff- different models that are available but i think i'd point to the first four that i talked about as the ones that i think will assume uh, a larger connotation uh, going forward you know it's interesting is so many institutions have to define which business models can be right for them both based on their legacy as well as where they want to go but but i think you know so I, i think your your point is that standing still is not really an option um the traditional financial institution that model is 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 really not a winning model with so many people being in that space that you've got to find a a new best uh direction to go so you know our research we do, we've done together found that one of the keys to successful innovation is really to focus on the customer experience and engagement now that seems logical but a lot of organizations really didn't build their bank around the experience and engagement the amount of engage you know how often do i go to my my mobile app and for something i want to do as opposed to simply checking balances or transferring funds so now what what recommendations do you provide on how banks can drive more intimate customer engagement in this new normal because i think we've talked about in a couple of recent podcasts that loyalty may not be based on what accounts you hold or how many how much balance you hold anymore and and lives a great example it's it's how often can we get them to really rely the customer to really rely on maybe their mobile app or their online app or or simply coming to the branch and engaging because if your brand is engaging and if the customer or member want to to engage with you you've made you've made headway. I mean that's what PayPal is trying to do with their super app and what other organizations are trying to do. So again, how how do you think banks have to drive this engagement in the new normal? So you've talked a lot about engagements in your podcast Jim and I think very often you've referred to the fact that you are astonished that uh, your bank has all the data about you and yet they come and ask you questions that they honestly have no business asking. Um So you're right I think in our opinion you know uh, this is more true I think post covid that customer engagement is probably the single uh, biggest factor that stands between outstanding success and mediocre banking and you know when you look at it uh, Jim Miguel all of us you know the three of us and indeed everyone else I think we would probably rank personalization as a very very important element in defining our banking experiences So from a bank's point of view this is not just about the kind of experience that they provide a new customer whom they're trying to attract so the onboarding um, and the pre-onboarding process indeed is very important but indeed even thereafter you know when the bank needs to retain that customer's loyalty on an ongoing basis and as we've you know discussed in many other forums uh, retaining customer's loyalty is 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 a far 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 more difficult challenge than i think ever in the past and certainly you know institutions can't take their customers loyalty for granted 
simply because there's choice available for uh, people like you and me. Uh, that said, I think while engaging customers has always been a key objective for banks, uh, clearly the you know the un unfolding digital trends, if you like, have made it clear that uh, it is indeed, I think, uh, the number one priority. And you know, it, it's not a surprise really. So when you look at when you look at some historical data, for example, um, you know, consider the fact that not too long ago, 15, 20 years ago, uh, well over 50 percent of uh, banking transactions occurred inside a branch. And that figure was even much higher in some other parts of the world, you know, in parts of Asia Pacific, uh, Middle East Africa, which are largely branch driven historically. Those transactions were even higher than, you know, 50%. Today, I think in many parts of the world, that figure is down to barely 5%. Since 95% of the transactions in the last 18, 24 months have happened, you know, through digital channels. And I think, uh, you know, going forward, uh, it's expected that by 2025, um, over 50% of the transactions will get done through non-bank, you know, third-party channels, channels that are uh, available and where, thanks to embedded finance and open banking initiatives, you know, a customer can leverage the same kind of facilities and products and services that they might traditionally have opted for through a branch or through a call center. And, you know, this kind of a shift is well underway. We shouldn't believe that this is futuristic. And I'm going to give, uh, you know, I think there are examples from Asia, which are probably more um, uh, noteworthy than maybe some of the Western uh, markets. Uh, if you take India, for example, uh, you know, through the UPI uh, uh, payment mechanism, over 90% of uh, open payments are originating from non-banking uh, platforms such as Google Pay, Phone Pay, Paytm, uh, and WhatsApp. So this is despite the fact that there are several dozens of banking apps to do these transactions. So this kind of a trend is already well underway. And I think it's going to sort of pick up even more in um, in in uh, other parts of the world. I think to retain the business of customers who are increasingly carefully looking at the alternative players, uh, whether it's the neo banks or indeed some of the non banks, I think banks must uh, you know digitally engage them in ways that uh, fulfill their purpose of leading a much better financial life. And this happens. Um, I just submit to you across all the four stages, you know, whether it's the ability to onboard them better, uh, once you onboard them, whether it's the ability to converse with them better, whether it's the ability to serve them uh, through your own channels or through non-bank non third-party channels. And finally, of course, the bank has to sell and cross-sell uh, products and services, so whether it's the ability to sell better. So I think all of these are uh, relevant and all of these are going to be increasingly important in the entire life cycle. And I believe that banks will, you know, very, very closely focus on each of these um, as they as they look to innovate, uh, Jim. Yeah, great, great insights because it, it it really is it's changing the the importance and what we really focus on. You know, live as you mentioned, lives a great example of of really building an engagement model as opposed to certainly it's it's not as much of a banking model even. I mean, that's what's so interesting about this is the whole revenue business case is very different. The revenue comes from outside the four walls of the bank to to driven by the the organizations that want to engage with these audiences and then the banking becomes secondary and it's not a push it's more of a listen and, and pull so um you know let's take a short break here and recognize the sponsors of this podcast this show is sponsored by fis have you ever felt frustrated in checking out online or making a payment over the phone? The go-kart team at FIS Impact Lab certainly was, and that's why they created a better payment experience. Go-kart recognizes your email and lets you pay quickly anywhere with no passwords and no long forms. You can pay faster for anything, even things you wouldn't expect like healthcare, professional services, and more. GoCard also goes beyond online checkout and allows you to pay easily by email, text, and even with QR codes. If you sell products or services online or in-store, find out how you can use GoCard to simplify payments and increase your sales at gocardpay.com slash podcast. FIS, advancing the way the world pays banks and invests. Welcome back. I'm joined by Miguel Rio Tinto, Group CIO and CDO of Emirates MBD, and Sanat Rayo, the CEO of Infosys Finical. 
We have been discussing the shift seen in both digital transformation and innovation maturity since the pandemic. So Miguel, at Emirates, what's your approach to leveraging modern technology to drive growth and profitability? What, you know, what are some of the key initiatives that you're doing to help your bank unlock this value? Yeah, I, I would I would uh, just uh, touch very quickly on on what Sanat was mentioning before about engagement and uh, and how you drive engagement with your customers. So so uh, and especially relevant now in the context of of what is happening with the changing behaviors on on uh, on with with consumers uh, with with COVID. Um, one of the things that that uh, Sanat said, which is which is true, it says it's been accelerated, which is the movement of your interaction with your customers is increasingly done by by the online channels. And uh, what we're seeing is an overwhelmingly shift in individuals to the mobile app, to the mobile app. And and the question then becomes, so you know that there was this rich model of interaction with the customer via the branch, via the relationship manager and so on. Now, now, how how do you make that happen uh, through digital channels? How do you make that happen to the digital channels? No, and there is, there is a very very simple question, which is how do you how do you make it that your app is actually sitting on the first page in your phone, in your smartphone? So, you know that we typically organize our apps, and the, the most used apps are on the first or second page. Now, that that's the first thing. So, how do I get you to come back um, and to to click on my app and come back? No, and then adding to that is okay. How do I interact with you? How do I engage you in a in a in a world where there's no human there? No, so how how do I do that? No, that is a very very deep and 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 very uh, important problem that that we are solving. So you've touched on some of the stuff we are doing. Um, finding so live is a good example about uh, on on uh, on uh, uh, having offers and promotions that are associated with your preferences, with your hobbies, with your lifestyle. So you have a reason to come back to see the promotions. We even we offer games. You have games. You can play very simple games in Live, so that there's a reason for you to come back. You you can earn some money by playing games as well, and and so on. Um, so so these are examples. But then then on the other side, and this links to another discussion, which is, in order for me to to then engage with you, I have to leverage your data, as you correctly pointed out. So how do you leverage then the data? To, to, to put some off of in front of me, to put some insight in front of me. It, it means things like you've spent so much this month on this, no? Things, so that's very, very, that's very difficult. And it, it takes a huge effort to bring all of this together. The technology issue is just a small part of it, you know? But having the organization as a whole um, build around this and actually focus on engaging the customer through a mobile app in a bank like ours is a huge, is an overwhelming effort, and it's clear at the center of our priorities. But now, linking a little bit to the, to the question you you just asked, so there is a there is a clear agenda, on on enabling all that we're doing, sales and services, complex sales even, and in engagement through our online channels, and at the, we are putting technology completely at the at the service of that. And I'll give you some examples. So. When we do that, banks have a, have a way of trying to digitize by just exposing the, the functionality on the app. But then on the back, everything is manual. You still have underwriters, you have compliance officers, you have you have operations guys and so on. So it, it's not about that. It's about doing it in a way that is truly digital, a, a, a fantastic user experience. And it's actually, we call it here STP, completely STP, meaning it doesn't touch a human. It's zero operations. No? To do that, and to code and 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 put in the system the the rules, the heuristics that the human was doing as an underwriter or as a, or as a compliance officer or as an as a operations person, that then takes another a huge a huge effort. And so our investments are on on digitizing these journeys, sales and services journey, including complex ones like personal loans, auto loans, and so on. Very focused on our mobile to some extent on our o- online channel as well. And this this covers both individuals and and corporates, and then at the same time making the end to end absolutely STP. And this means replacing every decision making that is there in the in the pipe with something that can be uh, 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 that that is actually a, a machine learning model or it is a basic basic rule system, whatever it is, so that we don't have any human in the in the chain. That's we are obsessed about that currently. We were the, before before COVID, it's coming from the top. Our CEO puts us some KPIs on how many journeys have we enabled? 
what is our STP rate on those journeys? Those are the two metrics he looks at. And then, the, and then adding to all of this is this has to be done. It's not just about the transactions and the journeys. It's about then how do I make it engaging in the app? No? And uh, how do I make you come to our app so that you, tr you, 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 you favor coming to me instead of going to another app, <laughs> to a competitor or even to a non-bank where you, you actually prefer to, to work with them and, and actually do the, your payments and so on outside of our, of our app, no? So, so it's interesting. So now you mentioned early in our conversation that you have an interest and focus on digital anthropology. So it's very curious to learn how you see the relationship between humans and digital era technologies evolving and how organizations can harness that to drive change. And, and, and just importantly, how do we make it so the employees that we do have learn more about digital and feel part of the equation because we found in our research that that if you don't make them part of the digital experience they will do everything in their power only because it's human nature to undermine your initiatives in digital so how do you see this work in the future the humanizing of the digital experience so thanks uh, jim for that question and it's a it's it's a topic that i'm very passionately uh, uh, involved in not just because of our day-to-day uh, activities, but indeed, I think it's it's something that's going to be increasingly relevant uh, uh, going forward. So I am, uh, I think, what you would call an accidental digital anthropologist. I did a master's in this emerging social science that gave me a broad perspective of how to look at things differently. And I'm particularly interested in those points of intersection between technology on the one hand and culture on the other. And as we know, human behavior is in, informed by many different things, including our own culture. But to respond to your question, uh, you know, I'm going to take the liberty of moving away from the banking industry per se and address your question a little more broadly because it's relevant to, I think, every industry, uh, banking included. I think as more and more objects, for example, uh, you know, whether it's our phones, fridges, um, you know, cars, they become augmented with digital sensors and wireless signals. Uh, the boundary between material objects on the one hand and information systems is gradually getting blurred. You know, we've, we've heard about smartphones and smart offices, smart cities even, right? So that's, that's a trend that's already underway. Um, on the one hand, I think augmented objects are now, you know, coming to be, uh, you know, described as intelligent agents capable of making decisions. Uh, meanwhile, there are a lot of theories about, you know, uh, information are being used to describe the very foundation of, you know, our lives itself. So for example, you know, what are the emerging practices involving big data, for example, or biometric technologies, surveillance, amongst other things? And how do we reflect and constitute and transform, you know, pre-existing biases that all of us have um, into our practices? I think banks obviously have a vast amount of data and more and more banks will become big technology shops to leverage data through AI and other emerging technologies. So, you know, who in the bank, for example, is worrying about what exactly is an algorithm and how does it work and who's responsible for, it out, for its output? So when a bank lends money and in the lending process, as it uses increasingly complex algorithms, you know, who's responsible for and who's looking at the biases that may creep into the lending process? I think a lot of times we focus on the lending process, we focus on the technologies, we talk, focus on the customer experience. I don't think enough attention is being you know, paid to the biases that may creep into the lending processes because of the algorithm. So this is a very simplistic example that I'm giving you. Uh, you know, technology is obviously a great enabler and can, you know, it can be wonderful in our personal and our professional lives. Uh, that said, it is precisely because of the great power that has been made available through these technologies and what they embody that we increasingly need to be focused, worried even, I'd say, about the way that the technologies are deployed. Uh, this broad perspective has led me to take a deeper look at an issue that I think is going to assume uh, far greater implications, uh, you know, in our technology driven world. And I, of course, refer to the whole element around the ethics of not just AI, but indeed of the way that, um, you know, technology is getting deployed. And, you know, on a, on a personal front, I'm doing an MPhil program at the University of Cambridge on AI ethics. Uh, you know, as my professor first sort of explained to me, there is an aphorism that says that anthropology, uh, if I remember correctly, he said anthropology allows you to make the strange familiar and the familiar strange. 
So to me, truly, you know, understanding what these powerful technologies can do for us in a progressive manner, how it can harm us in one way if you're not careful, but also, you know, uh, how it can define the relationships between humans on the one hand and digital area technologies on the other is going to be the very essence of the way I think uh, organizations and leading banks uh, particularly are going to deploy technology. So it's a, it's a big topic, um, um, <laughs> Jim, and something that I can talk on ours uh, at length about. And I hope I can discuss that with you some other time. You know, it's, it's very interesting because we, we, the, the whole dynamic from hiring people, training people, making sure you're hiring for the future as we're evolving is what we need for people. And again, that, that we can't ignore how humans can be involved in the development of technology and how technology can assist humans. It's, 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 it's a lot to get your hand around. So finally, Miguel, um, Peter Drucker once said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, your leadership at your organization obviously supports innovation throughout the entire organization. For those firms that are not as far down the road as Emirates NBD, what kind of culture shift do you believe is required to drive innovation? You know, I we had an interview with the uh, CEO of Lemon, and he said, you know, the biggest hindrance to digital transformation is legacy leadership. Now, what, where would you start if you're an organization and you're working for an organization that you just get the feeling that, boy, top management just isn't embracing change, kind of is riding the, the rails of success that they've had for 30 or more years. So what kind of culture shift do you believe is needed to drive innovation going forward. So, so uh, um, Jim, I fully agree that culture and uh, a culture of innovation is, is absolutely ne necessary to thrive uh, in banking, anywhere actually, but in banking in particular, uh, in the world we are in. Um, I, think, I think there is a prerequisite for that. Uh, and then there are, there are things you can do uh, to, to actually move towards a more innovative culture. So a prerequisite is, is at the top, if these things are not uh, understood, that that for example, in banking, that banking is actually a technology company. In in uh, in I don't know if it's going to be five years, ten years, fifteen years. Um, uh, banks will will have more bank more engineers, software engineers. They will have then they will have bankers. If you look at uh, f fintechs uh, like like Revolut and so on, 80, 80 90 percent of their employees are engineers, no? And actually uh, from the top at Emirates NBD, uh, that, that understanding is that you have to digitize, technology is key, you have to hold the know-how, you have to, know, to to drive your your IT strategy, you have to drive, you have to have engineers and foster them. This is a core competency, is a key advantage for the bank. So that's that I would say is a prerequisite. And I'm, as I was uh, telling, I've, I'm very lucky at more than exco level, uh, and, and it's particularly a CEO or CEO Shane, he's is he has a, a fantastic clarity on that. That that's a prerequisite. Now, that's very nice, but you can have that, but then the the organization is still the, a legacy organization, and and uh, and we are again we are fighting every day as as uh, an incumbent organization that we are. Uh, it's not easy. It's it's very difficult. No? The 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 approach here was was a little bit the following. So again, understanding that technology is at the core, let's start a, a, a big technology transformation. Let's bring in, for example, new a, a new agile way of working where we bring squads together, multidisciplinary competencies and so on. Let's bring it through IT. And then let's start embedding the business into this as well. So let's start eating the business from inside. So, and, and this is how we are approaching it. And, and it, is, it is very transformative. So. We brought, we, we, we started this technology transformation. One of the key work streams around this is the agile way of working. You, you form smaller squads, they own a, an IT product, they enhance the product with a view of the product ownership. So your mobile app, app is actually a product. It's no longer a, a banking, a personal loan is not, it's not just the product that you have in banking. It's the mobile app is, app is a product. It's a product in itself. So that knowledge, then you start and ask, okay, business, you have to nominate a product owner for this someone that will guide us on the enhancements that have to be done here. And so they nominate the product owner. Then this guy has to have stature. This guy's to coordinate across all the priorities and the strategic priorities that are coming. So you start eating the business from inside through the technology uh, stream, you know, and, and this is how we're trying to, 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 to really foster a different way of working, a much more blended IT business interface 
Uh, and again, when you do that, and and you and you put the right processes in place, you put the right people. Because uh, in IT, for example, we had to replace about forty percent of our managers to be able to bring that in. It's it's a mix of changing two thirds of the people that exist and uh, hiring one third of new people as well. I'm part of the new people that was onboarded to actually change the organization four years ago within IT. So so. I think these are the two things that, so on one hand, uh, a, strong, a, a, a clear, le clear leadership from the CEO, from the exco, from the leadership that this is important, this is the way to go. And, and I, I have a, a very clear leadership on that and, and thankful for that. And at the same time, a, a, a thrust to change from within by blending IT and technology further around these, uh, these ways of working, which actually the, the Amazons and the, and the Googles and so on. These are, this is the way they, they work. They see search as a product, you know? So this is new for us. They've been doing it for 20 years now. So it's, 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 it's around that. It's not easy. It's a, an everyday struggle. You find a lot of blockers, compliance, ops risk, you know? So it's, but it's, it's part of the, of the journey. Uh, and again, if you have then the leadership to be able to, to, to take these obstacles that are in the way, these blockers and help you overcome them, then, then things flow. What an amazing place to end. Um, I want to thank both you gentlemen for your time today. Um, it, it's interesting is I, I think I've already developed what the headline or what the title of this podcast is going to be. And it's really going to be the masterclass in innovation and digital transformation in the future of banking. Because, you know, what a learning experience. You, you shared a lot of insight. There's a lot of things to do. And, and what you shared is really a, 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 a path for the future. And again, thank you both for being on the show today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. It's our privilege to be with, you know, associated with you and Digital Banking Report, and of course, with Miguel and his team at uh, Emirates NBD. So thank you for the, for the opportunity today. Thanks for listening to Banking Transformed, right as a top five banking podcast. I generally appreciate the support you have provided over the past two years. If you enjoy what we are doing, please be sure to follow Banking Transform in your favorite podcast app. In addition, please take 30 to 45 seconds to show some love in the form of a review. It means the world to us. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the amazing research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, innovation doesn't just come from giving people incentives. It comes from creating environments where their ideas can connect.